Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Hydration Lecture Series. This is the second one for 2013-14. Uh, uh, um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Lottom from uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, he's a medical doctor, urologist with specialty in uh, uh, kidney stones and, uh, and uh, urinary tract cancer. Uh, I would like to thank all of you coming here in the auditorium and also would like to thank uh, all the online users that we have, uh, the viewers across the world from the webcast. So without further ado, I would like to thank you again and uh, looking forward to hear your presentation. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, visit, a uh, look at the hydration physiology labs and uh, I'd like to talk to you today about kidney stones, epidemiology and cost and uh, definitely be happy to answer questions if they come up. So uh, kidney stones are actually quite prevalent disease. Anywhere from up to 13% of men will form a stone in their lifetime and 7% of women. They form as a result of environmental and metabolic risk factors and it's associated with a significant economic burden, over $2 billion and uh, cost as high as $5 billion per year in the U.S. alone. There's a significant worldwide prevalence, uh, ranging from 1 to 5 percent in Asia to as high as 20 percent in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Europe and North America range from 5 to 9 percent to as high as 13 percent. There's always a caveat with that because in, in continents where there's not a lot of imaging involved, such as in Asia and even in Africa, we don't, don't really know the true prevalence of stones. In America, where everybody who goes to the emergency room gets a CAT scan, you see a lot of incidental small stones that were not symptomatic. Um, but if you don't do x-rays on people, you won't find as many stones. So why do we make stones? Well, it's a basic chemical equation. There's, uh, there's more solute than fluid, and the urine has to be supersaturated in order to make stones. So if you have more calcium and oxalate and uh, very little fluid, then people get uh, are able to make, uh, make crystals, and the main crystals in the urine are calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, and those are the, the main constituents of the stones. Unfortunately, or fortunately, supersaturation is not sufficient for crystallization to occur because uh, our body has inhibitors that reduce the risk of stones. So not everybody who gets dehydrated will make a stone. Uh, and urine calcium, which most of us are familiar with for stones, but also oxalate are equal contributors to urinary saturation of calcium monoxalate. So who gets stones? Well, there's certainly a gender bias. Adult men are more likely to make stones than women. Uh, there's an ethnic distribution. Uh, Caucasians are more likely to make stones than Hispanics, Asians, and African American. And there's an age uh, distribution. Children rarely make stones. Elder elderly rarely make stones. It's usually people in their 40s to the 50s who make stones. There has been some increase and change in the gender distribution. Uh, there was a study from the National Inpatient Sampling with over a million discharges for stones over a five-year period of time. Uh, the discharge for stones increased by about 19% overall. And after adjusting for population changes, the increase in kidney and ureteral stones for women increased 22% and 14%. And that changed the gender ratio from 1.7 uh, to 1 to 1.3 to 1 male to female ratio. So still men make more stones in women, but women are catching up. So again, the main ideology for kidney stones is low urine volume, and um, the stone rate increases based on increased urinary saturation. There are two very large studies, uh, one in uh, male health professionals, primarily uh, doctors, about 45,000 of them, and about 91,000 nurses. And the fluid intake was inversely related to the risk of stones. So the more you drank, the less likely you were to make stones. There's also a randomized trial in people who already made stones that showed a significant decrease in recurrence rates of stone formers who increased their fluid intake. Conditions that predispose to fluid loss are also strong, uh, strong, strongly associated with stones. And so if you look at uh, several different studies, there was one in Israel uh, where they looked at hot, arid villages, compared them to those in more temperate areas. The ones in hot, arid villages made more stones. Uh, they looked at British Navy personnel who were uh, stationed in the tropics and compared it to those uh, who were back in the UK, and they made more stones. 
They compared stone, uh, marathon ru runners with match controls, and there was three to five times higher incidence of stones in people who ran a lot. What about geographic effects? It's interesting. The U.S. has a, a what we call a stone belt, where there's twofold higher incidence or prevalence of stones in the southeastern U.S. than in the north. In ambient, mean annual temperature correlates strongly with regional variation in stone prevalence. I look at a map of the U.S. and you can look, you can see that in the stone belt there's a significantly higher risk of stone than in the northern part of the U.S. And if you look at similar maps looking at mean annual temperatures, you can see that an increase uh, is associated with a higher risk of stone. How about seasonal changes? Well, there's definitely been uh, described having stone seasons. Uh, uh, in Texas, one summer, there were 70 days over 100 degrees, and you can't imagine that that didn't contribute to stones uh, a few months later as people got dehydrated. If you look at people, at uh, soldiers that go to desert military deployments, uh, you can see a seasonal cyclicity. And if you look at places like Taiwan, where it's hot most of the year, there's still seasonal variation. This is a graph, a graph of uh, soldiers. Uh, and what you can see here is that um, uh, looking at time zero here for deployment, you can see that even as much as three months, there's a peak in how many stones these soldiers who previously never made stones uh, started making stones, and this is looking at a single U.S. military hospital in Kuwait uh, in the summer of 2003. And so the peak was around 90 days. What about the risk for incident stones in men? Uh, again, we're going to look specifically at the study um, uh, in uh, 45,000 uh, physicians without a history of stones and look at the risk factors for stones. They made about 1,400 stones, so not a huge number, but this was over a relatively small period of time. So younger men were more likely to make stones, uh, but a higher intake of dietary calcium actually did not increase your risk for stones, nor did the use of dietary supplements. But many people wonder why increasing calcium doesn't increase your risk for stones when most stones are made out of calcium. And the reason for that is that uh, calcium actually binds in the intestinal tract with oxalate uh, as much as it does in the urinary tract. And actually, sometimes people have described taking high calcium as protective because it decreases how much oxalate you absorb. Most of the time, though, we don't recommend taking calcium if you're making stones unless you specifically have some metabolic conditions where you have a high oxalate in the urine, and we just recommend a moderate intake. Interestingly, a low calcium intake also increases your risk for stones, and that's because you don't have enough calcium to bind to oxalate in the intestinal tract. So for most stone formers, we try to follow the golden rule, sort of a moderate intake of everything and then increased fluid intake. When they looked at other factors for stone formation, they found that high doses of, of vitamin C uh, can increase the risk of stone, and that's because it can get converted to oxalate. Um, animal protein uh, can increase your risk. Uh, fluid, magnesium, and potassium lower your risk. And then other things such as sodium, sugar, vitamins uh, had no impact. <coughs> Looking at uh, the female health study, uh, nurses' health study two, 96,000 women over an eight-year period of time. Again, high intakes of dietary calcium did not increase the, the risk for stone, nor did supplemental calcium. That's obviously important for us to tell women because they're at increased risk for osteoporosis, and women are always being told take more calcium. So it's important to tell stone formers that it's not dangerous to take supplements. Other factors, uh, we found that, again, fluid decreased uh, the risk of stone formation. Uh, sugar in this study happened to increase the risk. Uh, sodium potassium did not impact it. Obesity is a fairly important topic in the U.S. There's an obesity imp uh, epidemic in the United States. Uh, the obesity rates are going up 25, 30 percent of the population. And so the people have looked at obesity and the risk of stones. They looked at th uh, these three large studies, 46,000 uh, 46, men and then 94,000 older uh, women and then 100,000 younger women, and they looked at the incident stones. What they found is that you know, almost any other, any, almost any parameter of obesity, either high weight or high BMI, were associated with an increased risk of stone formation. 
if you look at the, this is the male study, uh, there's almost a linear association between an increase in BMI and stone, and that's mirrored in the two nurses studies. Uh, it was more significant in younger women than in older women, but still, uh, there's always been a linear association uh, with stone formation. Again, obesity uh, also impacts the risk of recurrence in patients who are already making stones. Uh, in this one study, they showed a significantly lower risk of recurrence in patients who are not obese compared to those who are obese. When you look at stone composition, it's interesting to see that in patients who uh, have diabetes, the significant increase is not in calcium stones, but is in uric acid stones. You may, uh, so here you can see that a normal non-diabetic population has about 13% risk of uric acid stones, and it more than doubles in diabetic patients. So why is there an association? Well, uh, there are probably several different reasons. Uh, first of all, obesity and insulin resistance lead to a lower urinary pH, and most stones form in acidic environments. In fact, uh, uric acid stones almost form exclusively in an acidic environment. Uh, obviously, there's also an issue related to uh, increased food intake in patients who are obese, and so they do have higher amount, uh, amount of oxalate and calcium in their diet, and more of it gets excreted in the urine. Occupational risk is also a factor. Uh, there are several studies that have looked at people who work in warm or hot work environments. Uh, one study from Brazil looked at 10,000 steel workers. They found that uh, there were 181 pa uh, steel workers who made stones, a relatively low incidence, but uh, not insignificant, uh, almost 2%. But those who worked in hot areas had almost 8% risk compared to those people who worked in room temperature and significantly lower urine volume in those people who worked in hot areas compared to uh, room temperature areas, and so it's not surprising that they were probably more dehydrated and more likely to have supersaturation and then form stones. A similar study looked at machinists and glass plants. It's very hot where they make glass. Exposure to heat stress was estimated with a wet bulb low temperature climatic index, and what they found is that machinists made about eight and a half uh, percent of them made stones compared to those working in normal temperatures where the risk is lower, around 2.4 percent. So what are the consequences of stone disease? Well, I think we've all heard that casting a stone is uh, one of the most painful things that can happen to a person. Uh, so acute episodes uh, result in pain, uh, loss of work, uh, hospitalization, surgery, uh, occasionally kidney problems and very rarely kidney failure, uh, and there's a high rate of recurrence, anywhere as high as 50% recurrence rate among stone formers. So these are all uh, fairly bad things, and they're all ex also expensive things. So one study looking at medical and pharmacy claims uh, from 25 large employers estimated the direct cost from uh, kidney stone disease in the U.S. was $4.5 billion, and the cost uh, from loss of work was almost a uh, billion dollars in itself. And this is just one year, $5.3 billion worth of cost. So it's certainly a very expensive disease. The other issue is an impact on the economy. Uh, stone disease, as I mentioned to you, primarily works, uh, affects people in the working age. Um, a study of more than 1% of the working age population, um, well, a uh, study found that more than 1% of the working age population had a stone in the year 2000. Uh, the expenditures for that one year was twice as high in those people who made a stone than those who did not make a stone, $3,500 more per individual, $3,200 for medical care, and about $250 for prescription drugs. About a third of them missed work on average 19 hours uh, over the entire population. So there's been some shifts in health care in the U.S. More stones are being treated on an outpatient basis and not as an inpatient, uh, but you can see overall that the trend is an increase in cost uh, and increase in each one of these areas of treatment. And as mentioned earlier, the risk of recurrence is very high. Uh, over a 10-year period, 60% uh, of men in this one study had a stone recurrence and close to 40% of women. So it's not typically uh, just a one incident. Once you have stones, you're predisposed to making more of them. So a lot of thought has been 
uh, into prevention. How do we keep people from making stones? Primarily, uh, we have focused on people who have already made stones. So we know that if you make one stone, you're about a 50% risk of making another stone. Uh, and there have been several studies that have shown that increasing fluids will reduce the risk of stones by up to 50%. Uh, and that's just a very easy approach. Uh, but as you know, it's difficult to get people to change their diet, and it's not so easy to tell people to drink more water, especially if they're not thirsty. Um, primary prevention is a more complicated concept because it's basically telling people who have never made a stone that we need to try to um, change your habits in order to prevent you from making a stone. There's only been one real study looking at it. It's an interesting concept. Uh, back in the 1960s when they were developing new, uh, building new villages in Israel, uh, somebody went to one of these villages and told them, hey, you know what, it's hot out here, why don't you drink more fluid? And to another village, he didn't do anything. He just watched them. And he found a 90% risk reduction of making stones in the village where he told them to drink more water compared to the one where he didn't tell them to drink more water. Now, that's never actually been reproduced. Nobody's ever done a prevention study, uh, even though it's, it's a very interesting concept. But again, you have to find a population of significant risk. So what else can we do for patients who make stones? Well we can give them medications to reduce the risk of stones. And there's several medications uh, that are available. Uh, thiazide diuretics, for example, lower the calcium in the urine. Um, there are medications like potassium citrate, which work in two different ways. Uh, the main inhibitor of stones in the, in the body is citrate. We normally excrete citrate in the urine. And um, the reason it works is that calcium binds with citrate. So instead of binding with oxalate, it binds with citrate. And then that's soluble and it doesn't form a stone. And so many of you may have heard of Citrocal. It's a product that's um, a good way of supplementing uh, calcium in the body. And the reason they sell it with citrate is the other alternative is calcium gluconate. And people don't want to take an extra sugar. And so the calcium citrate uh, is a good soluble product. But um, the problem with it is it can cause indigestion. And it's very expensive, as I'll show you here shortly. And so patients don't really like to take it. Well, the concept, of course, of giving medication is you make less stones uh, and you should lower treatment costs. The downside is that you have the cost of medication and you have to evaluate patients to find out who should be on what type of drug. Um, and so if you're trying to develop a model and try to predict whether or not it's a good idea or not a good idea to evaluate everybody and medicate them, uh, the main, uh, main issue that co drives cost is how many stones people make, so the risk, uh, the recurrence rate, and then the cost comes from medication, from evaluation, and if somebody has a recurrence, whether or not they need surgery. And so people have previously looked at cost effectiveness of medical evaluation and management. And this one large study uh, basically looked at people who came to the urologist for treatment for stones. And then they evaluated everybody, and they gave everybody medication. And at the end of the day, they said, well, we saved a lot of money, anywhere from 1000 to $3,000 uh, per year. Uh, and they had a reduction in stone rates, about 83%. The problem is that what they didn't do is they accounted for the fact that if a patient comes to see me for a stone, and I tell them, drink more water, you know there's already a 50% risk reduction without even giving them medication. And so, and that has very little cost compared to a medication that costs $800 or $1,000 per year. So they didn't account for that. They didn't say what would have happened if we had just told them to drink water. Um, they also looked at, not at the patients who needed surgery, but just at the likelihood of making another stone. And there's a problem with that because not everybody who makes a stone needs surgery. Some people will just pass the stone at home and then there's no, there's some pain and suffering, but there's no cost involved. And if you're trying to assess, you know, if something's cost effective, you have to actually figure out if it's something that's expensive or not. So what are the considerations when you're trying to figure out uh, if you should strategize to treat patients or not? Uh, one, you have to figure out what happens if you just give very simple recommendations. Uh, drink more water, cut down salt in the diet, and, and maybe cut down on oxalate intake. And what you find is that only about 10 to 20% of patients who make a new stone actually even have symptoms. 
So there are many people in this room, and myself included, we've never had an x-ray. You might have a small stone, you just don't know about it. And, and if, in fact, uh, if you follow people with stones, many times you'll follow a stone for five, ten years, and the patient will never complain of any problem. It's just sitting there in the kidney, and it doesn't hurt. It usually only hurts if, it's, if you're passing a stone, because then it blocks the kidney, and urine can't go anywhere, and the kidney descends, and it causes a lot of pain. But just having a stone sitting there doesn't usually cause any problem. The other issue is that a very expensive part of treating kidney stones is doing surgery. You have anesthesia, you have to pay the hospital, you have to pay me the surgeon. And if you don't have to do surgery, then treating stones is not that expensive. You might give them a little bit of morphine and some fluids, and then you send them home and they pass it on their own. And only about half the patients who ever come in and have symptoms ever really need surgery. And most people who have small stones, they pass them on their own. They don't require surgery. And the final caveat is it's expensive to collect 24-hour urines and do blood work and things like that. And one, one possibility is just to give people medication. Potassium citrate works for almost every stone former. You don't necessarily have to evaluate them. We know that citrate is going to reduce the risk of stones, whether or not they, uh, for most people, regardless of what metabolic problem they have. So we basically developed a... Um, decision analysis model. And basically our model said the following. Uh, you can take everybody who makes a stone and you don't evaluate them. And you either just tell them, change your diet, or you can say, we're going to give you drugs and we're going to treat you. The other option is to evaluate everybody. And then you're going to, of course, uh, you can do simple evaluation, which is not that expensive, or you can do a comprehensive evaluation, which is very expensive. And then you can only treat those people who you find a problem, so directed medical therapy. And that, of course, spares the people who have no metabolic problem and maybe they just need to drink more water from having to take medication. And if you do this uh, type of modeling, what you find is if somebody only make, made their first stone, so they, they've never made a stone before, they're 40, they pass a stone, that it's, the conservative therapy is the cheapest. It always is cheapest not to give medication. Uh, but that the recurrence rate is actually fairly low, only 0.07 stones per patient per year. In other words, somebody would, if you just told them to drink water, to make a stone every 14 years, and it'd be hard to convince somebody to take a medication every day the rest of their life to prevent something that happens only every 14 years. But recurrent stone formers, if you tell them just to drink more water, it's, of course, cheaper than paying for medication, but they have a fairly high recurrence rate. In fact, recurrence rate can be up to 20 to 30 percent per year. And it's very difficult to ethically tell somebody who's made multiple stones, just keep living, living this way. Don't worry about it. Just, you just, every couple of years, we'll do surgery on you. So what you find is that treatment with medication costs anywhere from $800 to $1,200 more per year, but you do reduce the risk of stones by 60 to 80 percent. So it's sort of one of those things where you say, well, it's costly, but also effective, so it's something that is probably reasonable to do. I think it's important when you look at economics to, to think about some, some of the factors that impact uh, health care. Uh, first of all, the cost of surgery and physician reimbursement is heavily regulated. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, um, most doctors get paid either a rate you know, for Medicare. Medicare tells you you do surgery, we're going to pay you X amount. Um, that number is kind of falling, but they tell you this is how much we're going to pay you. So you can ask for $10,000 and they'll give you $500 and say this is, what we're, this is what you get. And insurance companies pay you a percentage above Medicare. So they may pay you 110%, 120%. So no matter what a uh, doctor says they're going to charge you, uh, it's, you basically get what insurance will pay. Now, medication costs are unregulated, so a drug company can decide at a whim that they're going to double the cost of a drug, and there's nobody who says you can or can't do it. It's kind of whatever the market will bear. And many patients have a high out-of-pocket expense for medication, so uh, you might know the last time you went to the doctor, you, you know, uh, insurance paid for that, but then they give you a prescription for uh, a medication, but the medication was only covered a little bit by your insurance, and you have to pay a lot out of pocket. 
And so there's a disproportionately higher cost for giving medications than for having surgery. And that really drives uh, a lot of the fact that patients don't take these medications. It's hard to take, have a patient take a medication for life. A medication use is daily. In fact, for kidney stones, you have to take it twice a day. Uh, and surgery is rare, so people kind of have a honeymoon period when they make a stone, and they might take a medication for three to six months, and they don't get a stone, and they say, this, I'm good, and then they, uh, they just quit it, and then a couple of years later, they may make another stone. They say, okay, wait, I'm, I'm going to take this medication again for a while. But uh, that really has impacted the ability of uh, urologists to reduce stone recurrence rates. Now, let's talk a little bit about primary prevention. Um, we do a lot of primary prevention in society. Uh, for example, if you have diseases like cancer, we do primary prevention. We try to educate people to stop smoking. Um, for cardiac disease, we give people blood pressure medications. We give them statins. And that's all to try to prevent future strokes, future heart attacks. Uh, for infectious disease, we give immunization, right, to try to prevent measles and pertussis, et cetera. Now, why don't we do it for stone disease? It's a highly prevalent disease. I told you, you know, 8 to 10 to 12 percent of the population will make a stone in their lifetime. Uh, it's very painful. People don't like to pass stones. It's very expensive. It has significant impact on quality of life. Um, you know, in fact, I see patients who don't have pain who want surgery because they want to go to Hawaii next month and they don't want to interfere their vacation. But you can imagine people who are business travelers who are, you know, uh, they, they're very fearful when they have small stones of what's going to happen if I'm, some, you know, somewhere in the third world or even in Europe and I'm passing a stone. You know, it's, it's not so easy to walk around with narcotics and explain that to the guy, well, I have a stone, I might pass it. I, I just need to have these handy. Well, it's not so easy. So there are problems, though, when you start saying, let's do something for everybody, right? Uh, you probably don't want to know how much it costs for us to put 30 million Americans on statins, right? These are billion-dollar drugs, and um, these are this heavy burden on our health care system. So before you start saying, well, uh, it's easy, let's just have everybody do this, it's important to kind of understand what the economic impact is. And so budget impact analyses really inf uh, they estimate the impact of new interventions on short and long-term health care budgets. And for an individual in the population, it might not be so Im important, but we all pay taxes. So you want people to be doing these types of analyses before they institute things. Uh, I doubt most um, government agencies are actually doing these analyses before they institute things, but it's probably a good idea. Anyway, so they're performed primarily from the person who's paying the bills, and they mainly include medical costs, and, um, and um, based on prices, you'd like them to base it on actual prices, that makes sense. And a Markov analysis is a type of decision analysis which looks, um, looks at things in the long term. And um, it's important to understand that. Uh, you know, I, I think if you watch the Pot Pie cartoon, you know, Wimpy always wanted a burger today rather than two tomorrow, right? If, if I were to tell you, uh, you know, do you want me to give you $10 today or in 10 years, you'd go, well, to do something with it now, I don't really want $10 in 10 years. Plus, you have to worry about inflation. $10 in 10 years might not be worth the same as $10 now, right? Um, and so, you know, it's important with Markov analyses they allow you to adjust for the value today for something that might happen as a future event. The other problem is that if you start off with 100 people and you're trying to, you know, have an endpoint like stone formation, well, you know, if you do it over a very long period of time, people are going to die of heart attacks uh, or they're going to start having stones. And so if you start with 100 people today, uh, let's say one person makes a stone, well, the risk of stone formation for that one person is different than the other 99. I told you he's at a much higher risk. So you no longer can do 100 people each year and do your same calculation. You need a computer to keep track of how many people do I still have in my pool, how many of them died of other causes, how many of them formed stones. Plus, each person ha may have a different risk. A 50-year-old has a different risk than a 40-year-old, so people age in their population. So we built a Markov model looking at 25 years, looking at different endpoints, um, 
making stones, having complications from kidney stones, such as the infection, which is pyelonephritis, or chronic kidney disease, or like I said, uh, people die from different causes. And we looked at a population uh, of healthy people, and we estimated how many people were at higher risk based on drinking less than two liters a day, which is the amount that people have estimated uh, would increase your risk of stone formation. And this was a study based on a French population, and there have been studies showing that about 80% of French people uh, don't drink uh, two liters of fluid a day, and I don't think that's unique. I suspect most Americans don't drink two liters a day. If you think of a liter bottle of Coke or Diet Coke, uh, uh, most of us don't consume that much. And so we looked at the 25-year period, <coughs> and uh, our goal was to capture uh, the impact of increasing fluid intake on long-term morbidity and mortality complications of stones. And uh, the budget impact was based on five-year period, but uh, you can look at it over a longer period of time as well. So you have to look at different assumptions uh, on your population. You have to, one, assess how many people make stones in your population. So for example, in France, um, there are about 21,000 stones, 65 million people, so a incidence of 0 0.03 uh, in the entire population. Um, if you remember earlier, I told you that about 1% of working population in this one study made stones. And, uh, and I think you have to take into consideration when you look at the entire population that you have children there who almost never make stones and elderly people who don't make as many stones. Um, and um, so uh, it's a relatively low risk for the entire population. <coughs> now the risk of recurrence is about 14% uh, yearly uh, based on uh, one study in France. And again, uh, we assumed 80% of the population would have increased risk. So then you have to estimate what the risk reduction would be if you, convince, uh, if you convince people to drink more than two liters per day. And there are several studies that have shown about a 40 to 50% risk reduction. Uh, one was a study looking at uh, stone incidents in people who did and didn't drink a lot of fluid. And the other one was actually a study where they took people who made stones and half of them they told to drink more fluid and the other half uh, they just, they didn't, uh, which is kind of strange and about 12% of people who drank fluid made stones, and 27% of those who uh, didn't drink uh, fluid made stones. So about a 55% risk reduction. Uh, then you have to, again, look at the cost of treatment. Uh, and there are various different ways of doing this. Uh, one, you have to ask a panel of experts or make a decision on what kind of treatment everybody would get. Then we looked, since this was based in France, we looked at the cost of care in France. And we found that the average cost of stone care was about 4,200 euros. And to give you an idea, in, in the U.S., it's probably about $5,000, $6,000, so it's not that different. And the rec cost was 2,700 uh, euros, and the rest of it was loss of work and other costs associated with uh, uh, having kidney stones. So what you find is that if you can convince the entire population to drink more than two liters a day, you can uh, save about uh, almost 600 million euros per, uh, for the payer for a population of 65 million inhabitants. <coughs> and, um, uh, or sorry, the cost of stone disease is about 600 million euros. And if you can get 100% of the population to drink fluid, you can save about 270 million euros uh, and reduce the number of stones by over 9,000. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you go tell 100 people to drink more than two liters, many of them will ignore you. Or they'll try to do it for a day, but they won't be able to do it for a year. And so that's sort of the best case scenario. But if you can imagine that um, the compliance is going to not be great, uh, you can see what the impact would be uh, depending on your level of compliance. Um, the math is uh, not uh, that difficult. If half the people do it, then you save half the amount of money and half the number of stone events, <coughs> and maybe a more realistic compliance is maybe 25%, but you still save 68 million euros and reduce the number of stones by over 3,000 in the population. So it's not an unreasonable uh, trade-off. So what can we conclude? Well, nephrolithiasis is a common problem. Um, best estimates in Europe and the U.S. is ranges from five to nine percent to as high as 13%. Uh, there's a considerable cost and morbidity involved. 
Uh, we know that simple measures of drinking water will reduce your risk by anywhere from 40 to 50 percent, uh, and you can have considerable cost savings in a population. What's the role of primary prevention? Well, right now we, there is no role. We don't, we don't do it at all. Uh, but there are certainly high-risk populations. Um, there are certainly uh, family associations with kidney stones. So sometimes you'll see a patient with a kidney stone, and they say, oh, my aunt, my uncle, uh, my, my grandparents, they all have kidney stones. Now, some of that is geographic. You know, you'll, you probably live close to where your parents live. Uh, some of it's dietary. You probably eat kind of what your parents eat. And, um, and so there might be some association. There's some uh, people have looked at the hardness of water and, and things like that. Uh, but some of it's probably genetic. And uh, we're entering an era where uh, you can, you know, you can go to 23andMe online, send a cheek swab, and they'll send you back your predisposition to cancer and all your genetic data. And at some point, they'll probably tell you, yes, you're 20 percent higher risk for making stones compared to the next person. Uh, we just haven't gotten there yet. But there are known genetic abnormalities that predispose to stone with different transport mechanisms in the kidney, et cetera. Uh, there's regional variation. There are known risk factors, obesity, which is uh, a significantly increasing risk factor in the U.S. Even among children, uh, rates of obesity have gone up, and people have shown that uh, the rates of stones in those, in those uh, kids is increasing. Uh, bowel disease can increase your risk. Uh, and then uh, we talk about family history, seasonal variation. So if you were just to focus uh, your efforts, maybe just in the summer, uh, when it gets particularly hotter, uh, depending on how much you believe in global warming, maybe that's going to involve the entire country, not just, uh, uh, not just the southern part of the U.S. Uh, and there's probably cost effect potential for cost-effective educational campaigns. So for example, if you're a city like Dallas and you have a county hospital, Parkland, which uh, has 900,000, a million visits a year, you may say, okay, look, uh, if we can reduce our expenditures on stone disease by 50%, we'll save five, $10 million. We could spend half of that to uh, pay executives and the other half for educational campaigns, right? There, there's a way to actually say, how much money can you spend to try to teach people how to drink more fluid prevent stones in the summer and what the trade-off would be because that money comes directly from taxpayers to fund our county hospital. Um, there's also a big role for improving medical management. And this obviously, you're not going to give medications to people who have never made stones, but for people with recurrent stone formation, um, it's important to identify barriers to treatment and evaluation of stone formers. I can tell you that non-compliance is very high, even on people who make a stone every year. They, you can only get about a third of them to take medications long term. Um, and many people don't even bother to evaluate patients, and so there might be a role to figure out whether or not you can just treat people without doing a complicated evaluation, uh, which tends to be a barrier for some urologists. Great. Uh, I think I left time for questions. Can I interrupt you for a second? Can you use the microphone for a question? Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to know what pharmacological treatment strategies would you recommend to providers in the era of narcotic use, and especially in working in primary care and or in an urgent care site, and the patient is unfamiliar to you? I see it all the time in my clinical practice. I'm passing a stone, and I need something strong for pain. Um, right. So you're referring to really acute management, not to prevention. So I think um, th there are a couple of issues. First of all, as a physician, uh, I don't view myself as a drug czar. If I don't know you and you're coming in in distress and, um, and you've never been in my hospital system and I don't have, we have computerized records, so I, can, I know if you've shown up and I know what medication we've prescribed before. So I'm, I'm going to give you pain medication uh, because I don't want you to suffer. Now, uh, you know, it's one of those fool me once, fool me twice type of thing because um, I would rather give pain medication to somebody who doesn't have a stone than not give pain medication to somebody 
tragic sound, right? That's, uh, that's not really my job. Uh, but if you come to our ER several times, it's impossible now with med electronic medical records. And I've been called uh, from pharmacies before. And if some, you know, pharmacies have registries of when patients are abusers. And so sometimes you'll get a call and they say, you know, this guy's sort of pain medication prescription at, at our other Walgreens or Walmart or Kroger pharmacy two days ago. Do you really want to give him another 40 pain medication? And, and you'll catch some abusers that way. Uh, but that's not really our, our, that's not my job in the system to try to enforce that. And, um, I don't really, um, you know, other people will police that type of thing. There are not, uh, well, um, you know, I think the average person passing a stone is not going to do well uh, with a non-narcotic. Uh, and um, I, I don't think that's going to be your ability to try to say, you know, are they going to tough it out or not? Because uh, for the most part, we, we inject them, we give them morphine or dilaudid acutely and that doesn't always, that's how I know if I need to admit them if they're not having great control with that. So uh, most of them, I think, um, if they're walking in and they look perfectly fine and they, you know, and they say, well, I really need narcotics, then maybe you can question it. I'm a, I'm a certified athletic trainer and I work with athletes, but and I teach the program, but if we, if, in an athletic population, you get athletes coming in with various diets and, you know, on the road and things of that nature. What would you say the number one clinical sign is other than pain? And where would that pain be that you've seen in your practice when a person you're suspecting a kidney stone? Right. The, the pain classically is in your flanks and radiates towards your groin. And um, the pain can be anywhere along that uh, course. Um, it's difficult to suspect somebody who has a asymptomatic kidney stone. So if they're not having pain, you wouldn't know it. Athletes do offer unique problems. We saw that marathon runners, you know, the three to five fold in incident. And athletes actually have several issues because they like to take high protein diets. And uh, these high protein shakes um, um, tend to make your urine more acidic. They have a lot of uh, a lot of amino acids, not surprisingly, and uric acid and meat, and, and uh, the more acidic the urine, the more likely you are to make stones. And so we tell people to try to avoid those very high protein and high salt. Uh, and then they also drink, you know, the energy drinks have a lot of salt in them. So they kind of have high protein, high salt, and then they get dehydrated. So they're at sort of a unique risk. Thank you for a great talk. Um, <clears throat> of course, my question is related to dehydration, and um, you mentioned a little bit about that. And my question is related to the time course, and you made an inference to that perhaps being chronically dehydrated leads to a future event. I was wondering if you could expand on that, and you know, are we assuming we talk about chronic dehydration, but what do we know about that link? you the slide on soldiers in Kuwait, and that's, you know, even within three months, people made stones. And it's interesting, the people who are, have metabolic problems specifically, they can make a stone every three to six months, um, um, even under monitoring by a physician who is doing 24-hour stone risk profiles, etc. I think the chronic problem is, is, um, is clearly a factor for people who live in these environments, right? Otherwise, why would people make twice as many stones in the South, even when most of us don't work outside and don't do field work, we're not steel workers or machinists, we live here in air-conditioned environments. Uh, but just the ambient temperature drives uh, stone formation, and so it must be chronic dehydration. Now, one of the big gaps in knowledge is um, 
to how exactly a stone forms from the beginning. Because if you look at anybody, any of us, where you wake up in the morning, the urine looks yellow or orange, and you're looking at crystals, right? Because when you're well hydrated, looks, your urine looks like tap water. So we're all relatively dehydrated anywhere from 25% to a third of our life. We don't drink at night when we sleep. And some people sleep six hours, and some people sleep eight hours. So that's relative dehydration. You wake up, your urine's very concentrated. And so then you say, well, why does 90% of the population not make stones? Because, you know, a third of your life is dehydrated. Well, it's because we have inhibitors, right? We have citrate, we have, um, we have pantothenol protein and other proteins that prevent us from making stones. So, you know, and we don't know exactly if it takes minutes to hours. Why does somebody make a stone and yet the most, most of us don't, even though our urine is super saturated for a large period of time? And I think that's an excellent question, but I don't have an answer for that. And to your question is, why is chronic dehydration? Well, that's everybody. Everybody's chronic dehydration. Uh, let me ask a, a more practical kind of question, like looking at the uh, guidelines or the DRIs for water, like in the United States for males is 3.7 liters, including water from solid food. So approximately three liters of fluids from uh, beverages, I would say, or soups or uh, water or soft drinks, milk, etc. Uh, in Europe, it's a little bit smaller, like uh, it's about 2.5 liters for males, two liters for females, and again, it's a total number. Uh, are those kind of numbers enough to prevent a kidney stone for somebody who is high risk? Um, first of all, I you know, uh, I haven't seen a good study in the U.S. that tells you how many people actually drink three liters of fluid a day. I don't. I don't have enough time. I'm in surgery eight hours a day. When am I supposed to drink three liters? Because it's tough. Nobody drinks three liters. Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, I, I bet, do you think 10% of the population? I'll, I'll turn it back on you and ask how many of you think actually are able to drink that. I think that... Um, the typical recommendation uh, is to make two liters of urine a day. Now, I would, I would tell you that that's probably uh, enough for most people, and then for, the, for some people it's probably not enough. And the people who tend to be um, the worst stone formers are people with um, malabsorption problems in the first place. Uh, people with short gut syndrome, people who have um, gastric surgeries or or intestinal surgery for obesity, because they end up having malabsorption not only of the fluid they drink, but also of, uh, of calcium, and they end up absorbing a lot of oxalates. And so you can't ever drive their metabolic problems away. And so um, the average stone former, you can, if, if they're motivated, you can correct their metabolic problems. But, but people who have uh, bad malabsorption problems, you can never correct them. Hi. Um, do you know if there's a link between caffeine and kidney stones? I'm curious, just because I, I have had two kidney stones, and I'm fairly young, I feel like, and there, when it happened, was in January, I stopped drinking caffeinated, well, I guess dark drinks like Cokes and Dr. Pepper and things like that, and then by May, I had my first kidney stone, but I did drink a lot of tea, so I'm curious if caffeine might be an issue there. Right. So I think you have to try to separate some of the issues. Uh, first of all, uh, I see a lot of people, because in Texas people almost drink tea, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see people who just drink tea. Like they don't drink any other fluid of any form. Um, the biggest problem is that they put sugar in tea, and so they, that's one issue. But tea has a lot of oxalate in it. And it's more of an issue from the oxalate content than the caffeine. Caffeine has not been strongly linked to stones, but it does cause a diuretic. It's a diuretic. And so what happens is um, that if you have a gentle diuresis throughout your day because you're drinking a lot of caffeine and you don't hydrate separately with water, then, um, then you're going to be at increased risk. So... 
but most of the risk from ski is actually oxalate content. But you could say the same for alcohol. You know, alcohol. Alcohol is not a risk, but the reason people get hangovers is because of dehydration. So uh, if you drink alcohol, but you don't then drink water to supplement the fluid, then um, then you have basically forced diuresis and, and then, um, and then a, a long period of dehydration. But I drink caffeine all day, and I haven't, I've been looking, but I haven't seen strong studies to support. If I drink Diet Coke, I don't know how much oxalate is in that, and that's too much. Um, can I ask one more question? We, uh, we have been, uh, personally and Dr. Gagne, we've been working on in the area of hydration, and Dr. McDermott, actually, all three of us were working in this area, and we're trying to come up with a simple way of looking at what guidelines we can give to people in order to maintain better hydration state. Um, can you recommend like something like a practical thing to your patients? I mean, telling them drink two liters a day, probably some people cannot even conceptualize how much they're drinking. Well, I think, um, uh, well, I, I conceptualize it for them. I tell them when you go to the store, look at what a liter bottle of Coke looks like. I think people have a good sense of what that is, you know, because we've all seen them. And, and I said, do you drink that much? And then they said, no. I said, well, drink twice that much, right? Because there, uh, but, you know, uh, most of the time I tell them, you know, what they've known since Greek times, you probably are aware, you know, I tell them, look at the urine. Because I tell them that that's probably the easiest thing for them to do to assist hydration. I said, if the urine doesn't look like tap water, you're not doing a good enough job. And I'll also tell them they're, you know, when they wake up in the morning, they're they're going to be behind, you know, the eight ball because their urine's concentrated because we we can't drink all night, and you know we don't hook up IVs at home. So, you know, I tell them drinking one glass with, you know, a, a glass an hour is usually a safe bet because most people will probably do half of that, but it's probably probably more than they're doing. So a glass of water an hour is probably if they can do it for eight to ten hours. That's they're going to get probably at least two liters in. Uh, I would like to thank you. We don't have any more questions. I really appreciate your effort and uh, thank, you thank you for visiting. And I would like to give you a, a little present from University of Arkansas, which is our uh, logo and the uh, old main, the original building. And, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks our uh, online view viewers from around the world that they joined us today. Thank you.